So, I've played Cyberpunk 2077 for over 200 hours. It's more like 250 at this point, but when I was making the presentation, uh, that was before I did some uh, further analysis of the game. Um, I've done two full playthroughs. Uh, the first one was a rapid playthrough, where I was just trying to get through as fast as I possibly could, because I was under the impression, wrongly, that there was a limiting factor in, in the gameplay in terms of you're going to die. By the way, spoilers for all of Cyberpunk 2077. So if you haven't played through it yet and you don't want the game spoiled for you, the primarily game design and also story, because uh, I have to do a narrative design analysis. So the first playthrough was rushed and mostly unsatisfactory in terms of like the way that the ending played out. I get what they were doing there. Like that was the bad ending where you're like stuck on the ship and you're going basically crazy and you're effectively selling your soul to Arasaka, though you can choose at the end not to. And then my second playthrough was much more satisfying. I basically did absolutely everything I could and then completed the game. And I got the and I went with Pan Am and I went with the nomads and did the nomad ending and it was a much more satisfying ending and it felt like there was some hope and, and whatnot. It was basically the you chose humanity and to live in society ending which is great. And I got all the achievements that they have, except for a few that are dependent upon different playthroughs. So I'd have to start over the game as a corporate and then start over the game focused on body and stuff. But so I'm not doing that yet. I'm saving. I'm going to do a third playthrough in one year from today when I believe they'll have fixed all the issues and have probably added a lot of content. Then it'll be exciting and new again. Let's start with effectively a review of Cyberpunk 2077, which is, you know, all reviews are opinions. So this is just my opinion. Some background on that, though, is that I played Cyberpunk when I was 12 years old. Um, it was one of my first RPGs, pen and paper RPGs that I played. And so I have a lot of nostalgic <laughs> feelings towards the game. So there was Dungeons and Dragons, and then there was Cyberpunk. Dungeons and Dragons was... Um, a sort of game where you level up and you become beefier over time. There's like, you know, you you effectively have nerf bats by the end game where like no one's actually taking damage uh, and then eventually someone can die. In Cyberpunk, that wasn't the case. You could you could die at any point. Some kid could come up behind you with a gun and blow your brains out. It could happen. Uh, and so it was a much more exciting and fast-paced style of gameplay. Uh, or Mike Pondsmith did a good job of capturing that sort of like fast-paced tech technological gun gameplay. There, it had some issues. It wasn't a perfect game by any means. Um, Any time that you had a netrunner, they would be off in a basically different universe. It's like a whole other game. So generally the solution to that was that you would do any net running the day before you have the game in like email, well, not email, but uh, over the phone or something. Uh, and then when you got to the game, you, you've sort of determined the outcomes of the net running. And so those events take place during the gameplay, but then the Netrunner can also be doing other things um, because he may have either he gained access to cameras and he can like inform people about what's going on there or they didn't, uh, in which case they're blind in those areas and can't help, but they're still plugged into the net most of the time. The pen and paper game is really good. Uh, if you play it, um, do the net running separate from the, from the uh, core combat and stuff. Um, or determine the outcomes of the net running beforehand, or have it handled by NPCs. That's my suggestion. Uh, Night City, I didn't play in much in terms of the, the pen and paper game. We would always like homebrew our own areas. You know, I'm vaguely aware of all the stuff that was in Night Cities, uh, in the Night City book. From a nostalgic sort of point of view, uh, my feelings on Cyberpunk uh, was that it overall is a good game, but there are some weird missteps in the game design, uh, which we'll get to. So let's start with a, what are the core gameplay systems of Cyberpunk 2077? You have the combat, your gun, cover, melee. You have the RPG elements, your leveling, perks, your street cred, your dialogue, dialogue choices. It's a big element. That's also an, a narrative uh, element, but uh, I didn't separate that out. Economic system, that's crafting, buying, selling, um, and uh, also any incurred fees, like when you destroy your car and then you have to pay a little fee, those are part of the economic system. 
you have the stealth system, which is somewhat separate from combat, uh, which involves visibility, uh, damage increases, takedowns, and, and other things like that, whether you're seen or not seen. Um, the hacking system, which is the breaching and the quick hacks, and then the quest system, which is all the open world stuff and the activities and secrets. Open world could be argued to be its own system these days, but I've included it under quests because that's what they did. First, starting off with the combat systems, um, you have your shooting, your cover, and your melee. Um, there are other elements to that. The RPG elements feed into this where you're increasing damage and things like that, but let's just focus on in when you're doing combat, these are the things that are important. In terms of shooting, it's a first-person perspective only game, unless you're in a vehicle. Um, you have head, body, limb damage. Disabling weapons, you can actually shoot guns out of their hands and things like that. Um, then there's critical hits. Uh, it's a DPS focus system, meaning that for, for whatever reason, they put everything into terms of DPS, which is fine. Um, and then from my perspective, the shooting elements are functional and they're fun. I enjoyed shooting things in the game. Uh, I have no overt criticisms here. I, I would suggest that they look at um, the balance because uh, very quickly there are certain guns and, and kits that you can go down, primarily handguns where you're just one-shotting everything. And if you're planning your character out, you can do it towards the early part of the game, which I think it sort of trivializes the rest of the game. But generally it happens towards the mid or end point of the game for most players, which I think is okay. Uh, the cover system, you crouch to get behind cover. Uh, you can aim from there. There's damage reduction caused by it. There's block damage as things shoot into the cover instead of you. It's automatic, it's easy, it's functional, it's fun. That's all I really have to say about the cover system. I enjoyed it. There are some bugs around it, but I'm not here to analyze bugs. Melee system. <clears throat> so melee system had more bugs associated with it. So it, it includes a stamina system where when you're punching, stamina goes down. You can hit head, body, and limbs again, which is great. Uh, they have a blocking system. You can hold up your fist, block a punch, and then there's a power hit that you can do to break the block, which is great. So you have those sort of point counterpoint things. Um, again, they have disabling weapons. You chop off their arm, they can't swing a sword at you. They have critical hits as well. It's also DPS focused. It's functional, it's fun. It did, does have a number of bugs in terms of when NPCs are targeting you with certain attacks. It like locks on and it'll like follow you, which looks really weird and doesn't really seem fun. Um, and then they also have Within the blocking system, they have a perfect block where if you hit it at the exact right moment, you can push them off and get a counterattack. In the tutorial for when they teach this melee system, it's great. The punching and stuff, it's, it's all done perfectly well in the tutorial. For some reason in the real world, there's a lot of like weird, wonky issues, particularly in boss fights, where I'm not sure if they why they changed it, but like certain bosses can like do things that don't make sense especially in the street fights uh, where it feels a little bit more arbitrary in terms of like, I felt like I was doing perfect blocks, but it, it wasn't happening. Maybe those are just bugs. I'm hoping they're just bugs. But overall, I like what they did with the melee system. I enjoyed it. Uh, RPG systems. So here's where we start to get into the bigger problems uh, that I had with the game design. Uh, so there's three core systems within RPGs, uh, RPG systems, leveling and perks, sorry, street cred, uh, and dialogue choices. <clears throat> uh, dialogue choices, normally I would se separate that into the narrative system, but we're going to put it here in the RPG systems because it's core, or it's supposed to feel core to a lot of like things you do when you're leveling your character, but uh, a lot of it doesn't feed back into, that, the, into the RPG loop. So they have multi-path leveling. You can level your player up to 50, uh, and then there's 12 activity-based leveling systems two or three for each of the core attributes. So uh, I actually have the game open, so let's just look at that so you can see what I'm talking about. So you have uh, body, reflexes, technical ability, cool, and intelligence. In body, these three here are also, also level up. You'll see that they're level five, seven, and seven. They level up max whatever your core attribute is. So if we look under cool, you see there's an 18 and a 20. 
So one issue here is that that for whatever reason, arbitrarily body and reflexes have higher values because it gives you three more things or it gives you an additional plus one thing to level, which gives you all these other perks. So we'll go in there and you can see that this skill progression rewards is a, a whole other leveling system. And each time it levels up, it can give you a, bon a benefit of some sort or it can give you a perk point. And the perk points can be spent in the trees here. Um, there's an imbalance, yeah. And that's the body and reflex have the three perks and the other other types have only two. I don't know why they didn't do three for each or only two for body and reflex. My suspicion is that there was going to be another attribute, either empathy or something else. And maybe these things would have gone there. Maybe it would have been like street brawler and blades or i don't know i don't know what they would have put there annihilation and assault maybe maybe they couldn't figure it out and that's why they ended up here <clears throat> but either way it's just a little bit weird it's fine though it, it doesn't take away too much the second issue that i had was that there is a perk requirement confusion uh, element um what am i talking about i'm talking about um when you okay let's look at I think it happened with cool but i'm going to show you in body so here they have this final perk called bloodbath and it if you read it it says perk requires level 20 in annihilation to unlock which is interesting but over here 18 level of the related attribute required to unlock this perk what does that mean early on i couldn't figure it out uh, i just didn't understand what it meant so i thought that i had to get put 20 points into cool in order to unlock Merciless. But it's not 20 points in cool, it's leveling cold blood up to 20. So I think that could have been explained better um, early on. It should have been part of the tutorial because it's actually quite confusing because there are two different requirements. So to get by athlete, for example, this requires level 20 in the related attribute, which is body. But um, to get Gorilla requires level 20 in Street Brawler, which is the skill progression. Now it is explained on there, that it does explain it in the tooltip, but I was still initially confused when I was making my character. The, the next issue I had is that if you look at the, um, let's look at one where I have here. This is a great example. So it looks like with these little skill tree paths, this is what's called a index vector, but really it's just indicating that these two things are related, but they're not related. You don't need to put a point here to, to get a point in this. Like over here, I can I can put a point into this without having this. You don't need the central one to get the other one. And these connections, they're not connected at all. They're not related. Um, so it's weird that they put these trace, the, these symbols between them that look like they're connected skills when they're not at all like this i don't have this at all but i'm able to grab this one i don't have any of the connected attributes it doesn't it's confusing it's a graphical confusing element and they should either remove it or make it obvious or make it in the tutorial that you don't need to buy related skills to get the other ones you don't need gunslinger to get high noon or on the fly or okay corral you can just put the points anywhere you want as long as you meet the requirements. So that was an unfortunate graphic user experience misstep, user interface misstep. Uh, now let's talk about the dysfunctional and the non-functional. Um, they have perks that literally don't do anything, <laughs> which, um, and I did verify this on, on some of them. Uh, so here's one, you cannot be detected underwater there's nothing underwater. Where would you ever be underwater and detected by anything? It makes no sense to have this. It just doesn't do anything. Um, and that might be the reason, I, I imagine originally, you would have to go uh, get leg up, then ghost, then commando, and then you would get neurotoxin. Maybe that's why they disabled the connecting elements. That's my guess. But either way, having perks that you can put a point into that don't do anything, that's really effed up <laughs> you should have disabled cd project red if you're listening just disable commando 
remove it from the skill tree until you figure out something to put in there. My my suggestion for this would be replace it with something like something like a water breach where you can leap out of the water because you already have the double jump and stuff. So if you're on the surface and you jump, then if you have breach, you can like fly up onto the land. I think that would be pretty cool. Though you attach jumping to cyberware. Here's another one. If you have dagger dealer and you throw a knife at someone, the knife is gone. If Even if it lands in the sidewalk or, or you hit them directly, it's not on their person, it's not on the ground. It's gone. That knife is gone. So you're effectively throwing knives away. So the only way that I would suggest doing dagger dealer is if you also were focused on crafting and you would build knives that you would then throw at people, but that's like quite expensive. Not that it matters since their uh, economic system is broken, but we'll get to that in a minute. Having dysfunctional perks like the just just remove them before you ship and then add them back in later when you figure out what to do with them. Don't leave broken shit in your game. I, I don't understand how that happens, but it did. And then um, please don't... I don't know what happened here. I'm hoping it's just a bug, but I assume it's not a bug because it hasn't been fixed in 1.1. Um, but if you... Throwing knives away like that doesn't make sense, especially when you went to the trouble of having them appear on the ground if you hit the wall. Just let me pick it back up. Uh, moving on, street cred. Uh, so what does street cred do? It, As you level up street cred, uh, it unlocks gigs and it unlocks new items for sale at different levels. But there's um, it introduces some cognitive dissonance, which is where your mind is trying to understand why am I doing this and why is it fixing that? It doesn't make sense. You're helping the NCPD fight crime, but that increases your street cred with like, you're effectively a mercenary, a criminal element, I guess. And you're helping the NCPD. How does that increase your street cred? So my suggestion for street cred would be uh, what I think they intended to do, which is a faction system. So like, you should have these different, like, and in fact, it's something that is very important to cyberpunk uh, lore, is that if you're good with Arasaka, then you get stuff from them. <laughs> you can go to their shops or their fixers and get jobs from them. I don't know what happened uh, in development. Maybe it was just too much in, in the time frame, but NCPD should be a faction that you could choose to help. But if you do, it should reduce your faction with like criminal elements like uh, the Tiger Claws and things like that. It makes more sense for there to be different street creds with different groups. So it should have just been a faction system, in my opinion. Dialogue choices. So the main story choices are linked to the ending, which is fine. And then there are, there's the minor quest choices, and they're linked to minor bits of content that can change. Um, and... My problem is just that the they generally feel very low impact uh, when you make those choices. And usually it turns out they were very low impact. Um, choices you make with like the tire claws and, and, and all that sort of stuff doesn't really matter. There's like, I think I can count maybe four or five high impact feeling things that I did in the game that were high impact and actually impacted the endings that I got or, or that were available to me. So that was pretty disappointing uh, for me because RPGs, dialogue choices are the reason that I play RPGs. It's just sad that that, that, that didn't work out. <laughs> Economic systems, uh, I broke it down into earnings, items and buying, selling, and then crafting and upgrading. Earnings seemed fine. When I was just earning money, I seemed to be able to purchase things at a regular rate that wasn't like too much coming in or, or, or whatnot. So they've got their economic climb in terms of earnings from missions and stuff. That's pretty good. Buying and selling, uh, item pricing just doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, I don't quite understand how they were pricing items. I think that they were, that towards the end of development, they sort of realized that there was way too much money that players could make. And so they overpriced certain things. And then uh, like, and they've got this the, the fantasy holdover of common, unique, rare, legendary, or and then there's the iconic moniker. Uh, 
I don't know that that makes sense. It, it make the iconic, I guess, could make sense, especially if it's something that the player does to make it iconic. Having a common handgun and then another legendary handgun that are effectively the same, that's a little weird to me. There's this cognitive dissonance that the game introduces in that they're like, style is everything, style is what matters. Um, but it's not reflected in the stats. Like, there's no one commenting on how cool your style is. In fact, no matter what I wore, I would actually get negative comments about my style, um, even when I was wearing things from Jin Gucci and whatnot. Just make it so that I can craft anything. Once I find something and I disassemble it, just let me craft it. <laughs> like that's, the, that's my solution to the problem, because then you have a whole addition to the crafting system that's going to be good, and which we'll get to next. Um, but my main issue with the whole items in the game was basically that you'd run across really cool looking stuff and it's like common and has no slots, which is awful. When are you ever going to wear that? Um, why can't I look cool and have the best gear? Instead, I had to find the legendary crafting components, uh, crafting items, uh, and there's a few that do look cool, and so I put together a suit of like the best I could from that. Um, but I would like to be able to wear whatever I want and have it be legendary and have it have three slots. Let me disassemble stuff that I find, and then that goes into my crafting, and then I can craft that thing. Why not? I don't see any reason not to do that. So crafting, upgrading, um, there's not enough back and forth in the gameplay flow for crafting, which is generally you want a, a loop where if you want to craft items, you have to go into the world to kill stuff, to get the things that you need, to disassemble, to then craft the stuff, to then have this thing that allows you to do more damage or whatever, and then you go back and you go through that loop. Kill stuff, kill guys, get stuff, build stuff, so on. The problem with their crafting system is it's broken. <laughs> it's self-sustaining, um, and that means that you can generate more components than you initially have. Um, so let me just show you, because that's the most obvious way to do it. So let's go to the crafting. So the main problem with it comes from uh, two elements. So let's start with the uh, perks here. So you get perk points and whatnot but it also reduces crafting costs by 5%, um, increases chance to acquire components from crafting by 5%, and then I think it gets down to 20 or 25%. Uh, increased chance to acquire components, reduce upgrade cost reduction, reduces crafting cost again. I think it, I think it gets up to 20%, but then there's also ones in here 20% chance to craft an item for free. That's a big problem. Um, reduces component cost of crafting items by 30%. So you can get a total of like a 50% reduction. And then over here, disassembling items grants a 15% chance to gain a free component of the same quality as the disassemble item. What happens is with all these things together is you get this where um, Let's say that you need epic components. This anti-personnel grenade costs one common and one uncommon. And down here, this, uh, I guess we'll do max lock. Max dock costs four common and one uncommon. Let's craft one of these. Go to your backpack, consumable, max dock MK1. If I disassemble this, I get four common and five uncommon. And there's a chance, a 20% chance, that it doesn't, it's a 20% chance that it doesn't use the components when I make it. So if I made 20 of them, two of them would be for free, not costing me any commons or uncommons. So I have infinite resource generation. You have it from already because it only costs one and one. Now, is that because of all of the cost reductions? I've reduced the cost by 50%. Even if it were two and two, you're still making more common and uncommon components than you are putting into it. Thus, you are able to infinitely generate components. So, and then if you wanted to generate uh, rares, you just craft a rare bounce back, or better yet, the grenades, one and three, one and one. There you go, this bio has grenade. 
costs one and one. You craft that, you get more back. You need epic components? No problem. Gash anti-personal grenade. Let's craft two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That one was free. Eleven, twelve. And then go to your backpack. And it's a grenade. Here's twelve of them. Now you get... Boom. 27 epic components from that. So I've converted, what was it? I built 12 of them, but it only cost me 11 uh, green uh, commons and uncommons, and I got 27 epics out of it. And that's not even the worst one. <laughs> the worst one is that you can get infinite legendaries that way. You do have to create the FX frag grenade, but it only costs one legendary item component. And because you have a 20% chance to make it for free, you can generate infinite legendary and now your crafting system is broken just fundamentally broken i don't know if that was intentional or not my suspicion is it was not intentional i mean you can see i have 988 legendary item components here and i can generate as many as i want so it's crafting is never an issue for me and i don't have to go into the world to pick up stuff ever ever again and that is bad because it breaks a core loop <laughs> where you're supposed to be getting stuff from the world and then going back, whatever. Is that intentional on their part? I don't think so. I think that they just didn't think that through or something, or they needed a bunch of extra things to reduce, to, to have perks, and they just overdid it. But either way, it broke their economy. I have infinite money generation and because I have, can generate infinite resources, and I don't even have to play the game or do anything. I just have to craft. Their upgrades are overly expensive, especially at the later tiers. Um, and the problem with that is that it sort of enforces you wanting to wait until the end game to upgrade anything, which is pretty unfun, especially if you find a really cool item. Um, you can see the cost here. It costs everything. And here's another big complaint. Why did they separate epic item components and epic upgrade components if you're going to cost or if you're going to charge players for both. Is this a bug? Should it only be epic upgrade components when you're upgrading? I think so. So I think it's a bug that they have that they cost both. It should only cost one or the other and it should only be upgrade components because you're upgrading. Why did you even create another category if you're going to cost if you're going to require both to upgrade? It doesn't make sense. So I'm hoping that's a bug and that they fix it. It doesn't make sense to me that they're costing both of these because effectively all everything costs is item components. You will you can see right here I have 18,000 legendary upgrade components because the limiting factor is always legendary item components. I will run out of legendary item components long before I run out of upgrade components in every situation because they cost the same for 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 upgrades. It doesn't make sense. So I'm hoping that's a bug and they fix it and upgrades should only cost upgrade components. Uh, and then maybe the upgrade costs at the later levels. Like if you continue to upgrade something over and over, you'll see that the price increases, the price increases, the price increases. I hate this knife, so I don't know what it is, but whatever, it doesn't matter. And then it'll reach the max level and then you can't upgrade it anymore. Also, it becomes trapped in your inventory and you can't put it into your stash anymore. Uh, and then there's a bunch of inconsistency in their crafting system. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, you can see here that um, there are these armor mod components and weapon mod components. These have a chance to generate uh, epic, rares, and uncommons just by crafting them normally. Uh, and you'll see, where is it? This one. You'll see here I have epic armadillo mods, and there's some rares, and there's some uncommons. I just made those. So that's one way to do it, where all of the things that you can create are common crafting recipes, but you have a chance to get epics or maybe even legendaries. I, I've never seen one that becomes a legendary, but maybe it's there. But then, but then 
they also have uh, uncommon ones. And when you create the uncommon ones, uh, maybe they're specific to, in, in this case, it's specific to one functionality, so you don't need uh, different ones. I'm okay with that. But there's other ones that are like percent chances, which they can only be rare. And I'm not sure why they have this inconsistency there. Um, and then there's even like this one's an epic one, increases armor by 7%. It's a one shot. There's no, uh, there's no legendary ones that I'm aware of. Well, there is. Panacea. Grants immunity to poison and shock. Now, you only need that once, so it's a little weird to begin with. I guess the point is if you destroy that piece of clothing or you want to upgrade to a new piece of clothing, you would need to make it again. Um, unless you have the perk that allows you to disassemble and get the mods back. But either way, it's a little strange. Um, in this case, it makes sense for Panacea. But it's a little strange that there are, that they have these that can end up being epics just through crafting, like a random chance. And then there's other ones that are not. I'd like to see some consistency in that regard. Why not have a epic armadillo crafting? Or either that, or why not have titanium plating be a common that you can get an epic titanium plating? Like, the, it's just a little weird, the inconsistency. Um, I'm not, like, dead set against it. And in certain cases, it makes sense. Like Panacea, which is, a, like, an endgame one that grants complete immunity. There's no granularity there. Though you could have granularity there. You could have Panacea that grants a percentage of reduction to poison and shock. 20%, 60%, 80%, and 100% if you craft a legendary. And then you would have people crafting these things all the time to try and get the legendary. Is that what you wanted? I mean, you must have wanted that because you have the common ones that do that, except for the legendary part. I've never seen a legendary come out of these, and I've crafted a lot, and I maxed out in crafting. So the inconsistency is weird. There's, I'd like to see you make this more consistent across all the mods, and then all the mods could be in one place, and when you're crafting them, you can pick which one you're going to try to get the legendary for and that adds an element of fun but you know that would build back into your core gameplay loop if you remove the possibility of infinite crafting which you currently have if you remove that by up upping the price on grenades a little bit or just making it so that you don't get the epic components out of them or something so if you craft an epic grenade it doesn't give you back epic components um then you force the player to explore the vault and grab items. Like It depends on what your core intent was. If your intent was that by the end game you can craft infinite stuff and destroy the economy, okay, then I have no complaints. But if it wasn't your intent, uh, you could do a lot with your crafting system right now in its current state to, to fix those issues. Iconic and accidental dismantling. This, is, uh, this pissed me off a lot. Um, you didn't. You give a warning when you're dismantling uh, legendaries, I believe. Let me double check. Let's make a legendary and dismantle it and see if it warns me. So here's an Ashura. Let's go to my backpack. Weapons. Here it is. Disassemble. No, you just let me disassemble it. Um, you let people disassemble iconics sometimes. Oh, oh. Oh, I can't disassemble those, but I could disassemble Lizzie. So you're inconsistent in this too. What, 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 why can I? Why is this not disassemblable? But Lizzie is. Lizzie's iconic. Don't let me disassemble iconics. Don't let us disassemble iconics. Why would you? Why? Why? What the f? Like that? That really frustrated me because I didn't even realize I was disassembling. Like there are rare iconics that are blue. And I was just disassembling anything blue because I didn't care unless it was a legendary or, or a epic at that point in the game. And so I disassembled several iconics. And as a result, as a result, I have empty spots. Empty. Yes, I disassembled the sniper rifle that Pan Am gave me. I didn't know it was iconic. I thought it was just, oh, finally, I get a sniper rifle. Oh, it's not very good compared to the one I found in the shop. 
Didn't know I could upgrade it at the time. Anyways, I'm missing slots on my wallet. I'm very upset about it. This playthrough will never be complete to me because of this. And it's all because you let me disassemble Iconics. Don't. Don't. Do that. Just don't. And while we're on the topic, here's another complaint. Uh, there's Johnny's gear. <laughs> you can see that I have many, many copies of Johnny's pants, and that's because I was trying to get uh, three slot Johnny's pants, which eventually I did. But the problem is, I can't get rid of these. I can't disassemble them. I can't put them in my stash. Let me put them in the stash. Why do I have to have Johnny's clothes on me? What is the point of this? It's weird and inconsistent, and I don't get it. Um, but at least you don't let me destroy them. But if you're not going to let me destroy them, let me put them in the stash. All of this has weight on it, and it's like sucking up weight space. Which, you know, I'm at the end game. I'm not really going to play anymore on this character, but that's annoying. Fix that. Please fix that. Crafting was the thing that frustrated me the most because the... The design errors were so glaringly obvious to me, having done crafting systems in the past. Um, but like, if you allow the player to get more out of the crafting than they put in, you're effectively killing the gameplay. There is one saving grace in the crafting system, which is the actually the leveling of the perk um, here. So at some point, what was what forced me to go back out into the world is that. The crafting is limited by the tech, tech ability. So when I would max the level of crafting, like let's say I had 15 tech ability and I got crafting, with, I would craft, 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 and then it would level up to 15. And then I knew I couldn't craft anymore and gain experience from it. So I would go back out into the world. So there is one saving grace in that the way they did the skill progression system sort of forced you back into that loop. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's fine. Maybe that was the full intent. Depending upon how much that long-term gameplay you wanted like were you looking for skyrim levels of long-term gameplay probably need to not have it so that the player can infinitely generate crafting gear the way that you currently can that is to say that you can just craft uh grenades and get infinite resources for crafting out of it self system visibility in combat uh stakeout which is a really exciting system i don't even know if they intended this as a system but i mean it's it's definitely indicated in the in the core gameplay through story missions so i think it is and then takedowns um let's start with visibility in combat so they've got the standard sight cones with radar notifications you can see it on the mini map where people are looking great loved it notifications audio and visual great i can hear when they something's wrong um, it's not overbearing it's subtle enough but obvious enough um, and then there are audio and visual cues and there's even ways to upgrade those audio and visual cues which i thought was really smart which is to say you can get cyberware that says, if I'm spotted, then trigger a slowdown of time, giving me uh, time to realize that I'm spotted and also get out of the way. Loved it. Loved all that. Increased damage from stealth, pretty standard. Um, you can maintain your stealth if you're careful about how you murder people and hide the bodies. I ran into uh, several bugs with this that really, really frustrated me at the time. But, uh, you know, they're bugs, so I'm not going to criticize too much. But basically, it would be things where, like, I would throw a body into a crate and it would cause noise for some reason. I don't know if that's physics or whatever, but it would alert everyone. And, and like, oh, I'm trying to do the stealthy thing and it freaked everyone out. That's not fun. Um, generally, it's functional and fun. The bugs are the issue. Um, and then finally, there's a character in the Aldecado camp who sells cyberware. And he talks about stealth camo cyberware. Where is my invisibility cyberware? Why the fuck would you mention it and then not have it? So rude. Even Fallout had that. Come on. All right, whatever. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, so stakeout is a cool system. This is a really cool system. It's innovative. I don't know. Uh, or I've seen it attempted in other games, but the way that they did it is super cool because of the technological advancements in Cyberpunk, where you can hack into cameras and there are drones. The way that they show off that you should do a stakeout is through uh, the story missions. There's a point where you're in the Elder Caldo camp and they say, we've got a drone over there and they let you fly the drone and you can use the drone to scan targets and 
breach their systems. You can even start an attack from the drone, which is interesting. I'm not sure that was intentional or not. It's it's really cool because it sort of um, encourages you to when I and I did this throughout my gameplay. Uh, you know, there's like a hundred hours of gameplay that you can watch of me doing this. Is I'll look for the camera, and once I find the camera, I'll breach the system, hack into the camera, go through their camera stuff, plot out how I'm going to deal with everything, and then either start a cyber attack, taking out people who are isolated so that they don't alert anyone, or I'll um, you know start nuking everything with like poisons and stuff, and then I'll run in when when I've run out of uh, cyber ram, or yeah. So I really enjoyed how they did that. Their, their whole hacking system is really cool. We'll get to that next. But the stakeout part of it was really awesome because I felt like I was casing the joint. Like other games have said, let's case the joint, and it always ends up being like a stupid story thing where your characters are having a conversation while you're staking things out. And yes, Cyberpunk does some of that where uh, you're like talking with the nomads and Pan Am about what you're going to do and you're staking it out. But that's okay because they back it up in gameplay and you actually can go stake out a place yourself, use the cameras, see how you're going to get in, look for any problems. And that I really appreciated that because then you're not going in blind and then your stealth is ruined because there was a guy around this corner that you didn't notice. If you stay in the cameras long enough and look at everything, you'll find the patrols. They did a really, really good job. Functional, fun, probably my one of my or one of my top three systems in this game that I hadn't seen done quite this well before. Good job. Good job. Uh, takedowns. Um, generally speaking, they're functional and fun. There's some dissonance uh, caused by kill versus non-lethal kills or non-lethal takedowns. They don't seem to matter. The only like there's a big emphasis on the cyber psycho missions to not kill them, but you can use lethal stuff on them, and then they're down on the ground when they're run out of health, and then you can choose then you would have to choose to kill them, which is weird. Um, so it's not really a choice during combat, um, even though they make it seem like it is a choice during combat. And that was a little bit weird uh, and caused some cognitive dissonance for me. And then there was there's another element in the core storyline where when you fight Oda, um, Goro complains uh, that you killed him but I don't remember there being an option to not kill him. I guess I could have used non-lethal to take him down. Uh, and that would have been the only element in the game where that choice mattered. So I'm confused. I'd like to see consistency here. Is killing versus non-lethal important or not? If it is important, then give that choice to me and don't have the cyber psychos always get knocked unconscious when you defeat them. It has to be a do I switch to my non-lethal weapon and then try to finish them off? Choice. So just be more consistent there, and that would fix some of the dissonance that I saw. If you go back and you redo your street cred um, and turn it into faction street cred, which I recommend you do, I think it's really important to have that choice factored in there. So if you, let's say that you have to invade the Tiger Claws um, warehouse or whatever, which I think is actually something that you do at one point, then your choice of kill versus non-lethal should matter in your street cred. So if you only do takedowns and you don't kill any of the Tiger Claws, then it shouldn't uh, overly negatively impact your street cred with them because it's just a job, you didn't murder anyone. And it would be really cool if they even acknowledged that like in, when you're passing them by. It's like, hey man, you know, hurt... Heard you, heard you took took down our guys, but you know, thanks for not killing anyone. You know, that's fucking awesome. That would have been great. Uh, I hope you do go back and, and do that, or you know, maybe for Cyberpunk two, <laughs> Cyberpunk twenty eighty seven or whatever. Oh, and those body boxes. There's there's a reliance on level design for where you can take people out and put them in the boxes. Um, it's a crutch. It would have been better if there was a another way to hide the bodies, but I'm not really complain too much about it um i had some weird situations where i would knock people out put them way out of the way um, on the ground because there wasn't a body box um, and then somehow they would get spotted even though there was no patrols going over there so i don't know what was going on uh, maybe it was a camera or something or 
I'm still not sure. But there's some confusion there. I'm not going to complain about it too much just because I'm not 100% sure. Hacking systems. So the hacking systems are the breach and the quick hacks. In the breach, you have a puzzle game. It's okay. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how the how to do it and whether or not I could always consistently get multiple uh, breach elements. And then I didn't understand the rewards from breaching. Uh, you can breach quick hack points, which is weird because it's the same puzzle game as breaching, but it's to get rewards out of stuff. So that was a little bit weird in, ter in terminology aspects, but I didn't understand what the rewards I were getting because I never used those components to make anything, even though I was in the crafting system. So don't know what happened there. And I think there's a perk I missed that allows you to get quick hacks from that, from the hacking. And I just didn't get it early enough through my playthroughs. So I just didn't even know um, that they, that existed. So I had to rely on getting quick hacks from killing people and, and buying them. The mini game just needs more explanation at the start. That's my only criticism because um, it's not well explained. It's sort of easy to understand, but it's also confusing to a lot of players. Uh, that was the chief complaint I got from other people who were trying to breach mini game and they didn't understand what they were supposed to be doing in the puzzle. Once I explained it to them, they got it. And then it became a question of, well, am I always able to get all three and I'm just not seeing the solution? I don't even know the answer to that. Um, I, my my feeling was that there are certain situ because it's randomly generated. There are situations where you can't get all three of the quick hacks um, in the breach, um, and that's okay. That's that doesn't bother me too much. It just needs more explanation. And if you you can relieve some tension there by explaining to players that they might not necessarily get every uh, breach at the same time. It might not be possible to get every breach at the same time. Um, but that's okay. Quick hacks. Spellcasting. This is your spellcasting system. And brilliant job on uh, quick hacks. This is my favorite system in the game, by far. Um, and it, even though it's quite limited, um, you separated your non damage versus damage ones. You separated and you made it clear that these ones will cause people to go nuts and like alert each other, and these ones will not. And kudos on that. I understood it. Uh, and it's pretty easy to understand from just what they are. Like the ones that reset people don't alert anyone else unless they, the body gets seen. Um, it was functional. It was fun. I, I've i never felt more like a wizard, ironically enough, than I did in Cyberpunk 2077 when I would use the cameras to jump around and take out entire rooms of people casting uh, using my quick hacks which felt like spell casting and like effectively I was doing fireballs and poison dots and it felt really good. I felt like a high level hacker. Good job. Quick hacks were great. I, I recommend anyone who's played through the game and hasn't done a quick hack focus build to try again, do focus on quick hacks and, and spell casting <laughs> and hack the cameras go from room to room and you can plot out a way to like i'll take out this room with these two spells then i'll move to this room and i can take them out and you can take out entire floors that way it's great um well done absolutely well done all right here's some here's where we get to some real problems quests and open world i break this out into world exploration quests and activities and secrets so let's let's talk about exploring the world um so there's some good elements and there's some bad elements here. In terms of the good elements, exploring the world, I felt like I was in Cyberpunk. You fucking did it. Congrats. Um, I felt like I was in Night City moving around the town and you got the aesthetic down. You got the elements of like, you know, when I turn this corner, it's like, oh, here's like a pink light district. You know, great. You, you, you faked it well enough that I felt it at least initially. But I then continued to play for over 100 hours, and over the course of that first 30 hours, after I was mainly out of the main storyline, things started to break down really hard. Crowds are very weak. These are not individual characters doing stuff. Um, I don't know what your excuse is. This is certainly what you pitched at, at uh, was it E3? When you did your demo, you pitched the idea that each of these individuals was a person who had a thing that they're doing and they have a life. 
but she didn't. These people vanish out of thin air <laughs> all the time. Um, they they may have a name, but it doesn't mean anything. And um, I'm this is I think one of my biggest disappointments in the game, mainly because um, they have names, so you give the impression that there's something going on there. But when I follow these people around, they're not doing anything. Yeah, Skyrim did a better job than you guys did. So just, you know, just start with Skyrim. What's, what did Skyrim do? They had these characters go from these locations and they have a plotted route and you just need to have a designer focused on sort of plotting that out. And um, there's a way to create a system procedurally where that becomes less problematic than you may think it is. But we'll get to that. Uh, very weak interactivity. Um, I, w I would go to bars expecting there to be like a secret side quest or like someone cool there or maybe like some event happens and, and something like that. It happened once and it was like one diner where like people tried to rob the place. That only happened once throughout the entire game. And every other time I went to a bar or a diner, I was disappointed because there's nothing going on there. I can't even sit in the chair. <laughs> And, you know, I listen to the conversations and nothing's going on there. They're not indicators of anything. I think there was one occasion where someone mentioned something that was interesting to me, but it turned out to be a dead end. It wasn't an actual quest or anything. So just, you know, a lot of wasted space effectively because none of those things are interactive. There's no events that can happen there. You need, you need more random events is what you need. And the biggest issue I have with the game overall, bugs aside, so core gameplay design wise, is when I when you complete the world, it's dead. Everything feels dead, nothing feels alive anymore. And the entire all the stuff that you set up in the early parts of the game through the main story missions and like in the introduction to the world, it all falls apart at around hour. 60 to 80 when you figured out all these things kudos to you for creating like 40 well more like 20 hours 20 hours plus of compelling gameplay that makes you feel immersed and everything but you created an open world game and you promised an open world game with all these little elements like you know individuals going about their daily stuff but you can't promise that and then give me a dead world when i complete um, all the side side missions and everything Quests and activities, main story, great. Great job. Uh, bugs aside, um, which I guess is the caveat of this whole thing, <clears throat> uh, I felt really immersed into the cyberpunk world. I really got in back into the whole world and Arasaka versus you know the Corpos and the Rocker Boys, and like it felt good. Um, side quests, great for the most part. Again, bugs aside, um, there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, related to the main story quest and I like how that linked in and how if you help this person that changes the ending a little bit or opens up options for the main story uh, as well so good job on all that the blue stuff so open world normally there would be little quests like the skulls and the NCPD things and all that stuff right now you can only see the fixers because that's all that's left on my map because uh, I have literally done absolutely everything um it, it's it's not it's not it's not procedural though but and my question is why why isn't this procedural you it's it, in, in essence if you clean out like these areas at the end of the game it feels like nothing's going on in night city they could have been procedurally generated and then just parcel them out over time uh, or even have loops where one faction will take over a factory and then if you wipe them out it gets taken over by a different faction and you can swap out the like maybe the tiger claws took over that drug drug facility and then you kill them all and the ncpd thanks you and then um the ncpd sends out a bulletin like you know x hours later of gameplay hey remember that drug factory you took out from the tiger claws well the um the voodoo boys moved in now you gotta can you deal with that yeah, there's all sorts of ways to go with it so i don't want to you know overemphasize it but having cyclical areas makes a lot of sense for this you built it already 
cycle quests through there where different factions come in. You can have a gang war, and, and you even did it. Like you had things where like there's gang wars going on, but they're not. They're one time only events, and it, it, with one exception, which is where the Voodoo Boys and the animals fight on that bridge. And it happens every time I go there. And I'm not even sure if that's a bug, but it's certainly not a blue quest. It's just always going on. Um, more of that. That's exciting. As long as it's not every single time, which in this case it is. But, you know, you could have that conflict moved to other areas and have it become an NCPD quest or whatever. Why didn't you do this? It's like, it's all there already. You just needed to change the few variables here and there. I know it's a lot of time, but... This this sort of killed the game world for me when I realized that once I've wiped out the blue quest, there's nothing left to do. And then there's the... This is a big thing that hurt me personally, is the inconsequential gameplay in the main story. And this is almost entirely focused on the car chases. You're, it didn't matter how many times I shot anything. It had no impact. Like, that's weird. So you can just sit there and watch the car chase and, like, ignore it. Um... I don't even think they can kill you, or, or, or maybe they can if you totally ignore it and your body is low enough, but it, why? I mean, you couldn't, maybe you couldn't figure it out in time. I'm hoping maybe you'll update those car chases so they will have some consequence and could potentially end, you know, early or, or whatnot, depending upon what happens there. You only need like three, two or three breakpoints within it where it, it could go wrong or go better to have it feel like it's impactful um so it's a little weird that you didn't um and then my big my chief complaint with the whole game along with you know yeah completion equals boredom <laughs> when i've completed all the quests and activities now i'm bored like i have exhausted everything of value to me and i wanted to keep playing um so it made me sad uh secrets these are elements where you're just exploring the world and you find something it's not on the minimap or anything like that it's just something you can find great job um i found i think five to ten of these that were really really cool um off the top of my head there was like uh the cave thomas star which is obviously a reference to tony stark and he he had been captured by the one of the factions out in the desert and he had to build his own suit of armor and he like killed them all and flew out of there that's like a reference to iron man so that's pretty cool so cyberpunk 2077 has its own uh iron man mythos um but he's not called iron man he'll be called something else so that marvel doesn't sue them but um these are great and i found the movie set oh that was another good one where it's like i saw like a, a red lake filled with bodies and i'm like what the hell's going on here and it turned out to be a movie set and there was a number of like movie set things I think that were pretty cool. More, more please. Those really helped when I was like feeling upset that I finished the game and I just decided to explore the maps. And when I would run into those things, I'd get really excited again. Uh, so it'd be nice to have more of those. Um, but overall, you need to create procedurally create quests. So uh, main issues. Uh, the Empty World. So here are my suggestions. For The Empty World, you need to add procedural quests, and I'll give you a game design for that in a second. Uh, you need random encounters, that is, events that can take place anywhere, uh, involving like a fight breaking out between two factions, or a person asks you for help. Like You just need more random stuff to encounter. Uh, look at what um, Fallout 4 did with their random stuff where like you can run into uh you know a scythe claw would be like one of their random events but also they would have things like where there's two um uh synths or there's a, a synth or there's two people who look like each other and one is a synth and the other one is human and they both claim the other one is uh the fake and you have to determine which one is real and which one is not um like cool stuff like that and there's like an endless amount of things you can do with the cyberpunk universe in that regard so uh i'd like to see more random encounters that could happen anywhere and i think most people would appreciate that um uh add procedural conversations this is harder this is um if you talk to any individual and you poke them 
maybe they have some set of conversations that they can initiate and you can talk about current events. So something I did for Stranger's Wrath was that, um, and I know this is super simplified, but uh, when I was working on Stranger's Wrath, if you went, you could talk to any town clacker and whatever quest you were on at that time, they would have something to sort of help indicate where you needed to go or whatnot. So um, since all the clackers look the same, they would all basically have the same sets of dialogue, but at least it was something that moved you in a direction that you needed to go. I'm not suggesting that exactly for this, but I am suggesting that you have some sort of procedural conversations that you can have with any NPC and then just generate a big amount of those. Um, and then once a, a someone's associated with one set of that conversation, they'll always be focused on that set of conversations um, unless you resolve the issue or it becomes a quest which you could do through this system. Um, more on that later. Um, uh, generate car sales. You have what looks to me like infinite generation of different types of cars. Have car lots. Let the player go to the car lot and pick whichever car they want. What is this whole like only these specific cars? I don't understand why. Because you can hijack any car so that that's not the limitation. Why didn't you just have like car sales lots like let me pick the exact one i want and like search different car lots to try and find the exact version of the car i want like why not you have it it's all there just all right whatever um bars and hangouts uh, as in counterpoints if i go to a bar have random events prepared for that like why not like bar fights happen all the time Except in Cyberpunk 2077, apparently. No bar fights ever happened in Cyberpunk 2077. That doesn't make sense, especially given the sort of tone of the world. And then diners and things like that have meetings take place there. Have important, like, like have uh, corpos hang out there and talk about company secrets. And you can, like, sit in and listen in or, like, hack a camera and listen into their conversation without being seen. And like, just so many little things that could have been done with those locations that it made me sad that like literally never happened. And then the last suggestion for the empty, to fix the empty world, uh, for any NPC that you interact with, generate a life focus, uh, friends, neutrals, hostiles, give them elements that create a life and give them a voice and give them a, you know, whatever else they need at that, at that point. And then just generate it for that character. And then if the player ever runs and and once it's generated, then they get a set path that takes them to their apartment and their day to day. If they work for a corporation, they go into that building. Maybe the player can't follow, but at least they're look like they have a life. Um, and then just make that something that like, if the player scans them, that, that happens. It's like, you have to do better than what Skyrim did, or at least that's the starting point. Right. Um, but you can do it in a procedural way where you're not having to design each character and their life path. You can have general life paths and then just assign them an apartment, assign them a job location, assign them a hangout, assign them this, and just pull it from a list, put it together, boom, that's a character. And then you keep their name and it's attached to that guy and then if the player kills them, you can wipe it and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Or you have like their apartment goes up for sale because they died. Or, you know, you can do a million things with that. Um, and it doesn't have to be super complicated. It just needs to feel like they have a life outside of uh, just being rando generated NPC ghosts, which is what the game currently has. Broken perks. Remove and replace them. <laughs> Uh, the water stealth, uh, my suggestion is the water breach where you can leap out of the water. Uh, that's just an easy throwaway design thing that I think you could do quickly. Uh, knife throw, put the knife on the corpse. You hit someone with a knife, put it on the corpse. You want to break the knife that hits the ground? Show it broken. Fine. If you miss, you, you, it sucks. But at least if you hit, you're rewarded. You get your knife back. Why not? Uh, for the junk disassembly perk, oh my god. There's a perk in this game, junk items are automatically disassembled. Do not get this perk because it will wipe out your high-priced junk in addition to anything else. 
Um, but either way, there's junk that is like 750 credits or more. And um, if you get that perk, if you get this perk, it will destroy that junk and turn it into components. And you do not want that. You want to sell, <laughs> sell them on the market. So never get this perk. You can just disassemble them by hand later. It's a little bit tedious, but at least you won't accidentally destroy 750E junk. Uh, broken crafting and economy. Uh, we, I've already went over this a lot. All right, remove or replace infinite generation. Um, again, I'm not sure if it was their goal, but the ability to create infinite components from crafting, not good. Uh, so I would remove and and or replace all the perks that allow that to happen with just something else. Um, and, you know, there's a million ways to go with that. Um, don't have any suggestions off the top of my head, but maybe I'll think about it in a minute. Uh, all clothing in the game should be craftable. If you find it, you can dismantle it, and now you can craft it. Please. <laughs> once Once you find it, just let me craft it. It's in the game. You can wear it. It should be craftable. That's that's it. Okay? <laughs> and then fix the inconsistencies. I already went over how the mods can be... They're all common, but they can be made into epics and stuff. Have it all be one way um, is my suggestion. Make all mods and attachments be common, and then they can have a chance to be rare, epic, or legendary. I think that would be more fun in terms of your crafting system. Let's let's go back to the crafting system. I have two more complaints that I want to get out there and, and ways to fix this. Craft multiples. Let's 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 look at this real quick. Uh, so if you go to the crafting system and you let's say you're crafting armadillo. Give me a multiplier right here times X tick up 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 craft 10. Craft I get 10 armadillo. Why not? Is the purpose of this system to make me sit here and hit craft over and over again? It feels like it. Um, or do you need to do it for technical reasons? I don't know. But either way, let me craft multiples of something. Second thing, when I craft something, celebrate it. Boom, you got armadillo plus, uh, you got an epic armadillo uh, thing mod. <laughs> celebrate it. Right there, when it happens, let me know that I did something good. There it is. I did. I get. A, I got an epic. But I don't know till I go all the way to my backpack. If I'm trying, like, let's say that you add legendary uh, armadillo possibility, like a 0.003% chance probably. When I get it, I want to know. You know? Ping. Celebrate. Sound effect. You got it. Yay, legendary. Just celebrate these things. I don't know why you didn't. It's, it's such an easy thing to add, and it adds a whole bunch to the user experience, um, especially for a crafting system. Like, you know, is this a common? Is this an uncommon? Is this an epic? I don't know. I don't know what I'm getting. Also, you should celebrate when the perks get used, like when I craft one and it doesn't use up the resources. That's not pointed out at all. So people may have that perk and never know it's being used unless they're watching very carefully. There's just some user experience quality of life stuff that could be fixed there, allowing me to craft multiples and uh, allowing me to craft multiples and allowing me to fix the inconsistencies here. Okay, let's talk about procedural quests. So this is my suggestion for how CD Projekt Red could do procedural quests. Um, and this is a breakdown of what was one of my favorite quests in the game, which is where you have to get uh, the flathead drone from Maelstrom and there's a bunch of complicating factors involved and each one has an element that has a setup and a payoff. So um, I've broken it down into these five elements that can be used um, for their procedural quest system. And then what you would do is you would have, uh, you would generate a list of all the discovery elements and then program those, and then the trail can happen, and then the turn can happen, and then the resolution can happen, and the reward can happen. So what's the discovery? Discovery is the inciting incident or the push to get you into the quest. In the case of the game, 
the player needs a flathead camo drone for a story mission, and Maelstrom has one. Um, so that's sort of the inciting incident in this case. Uh, but this could be anything from a woman comes up to you on the street and says, you know, my husband's trying to kill me, or uh, a cyber psycho sighting over somewhere. Um, all of these things could be inciting incidents, and they can just be listed into, they can be put into a column and pulled from uh, randomly, and then when you pull it, you assign a character or an NPC to it, and, and so on, or you generate that NPC. Um, next is the trail. This is where you gather intel for future choices. Uh, in this case, for the game, you could talk to Meredith uh, from Militech about the flathead, or you could go to Maelstrom directly and just ignore that component. Uh, what this does is it gives you an option, and when you use it, you feel smart. If the player doesn't use it, then they don't know about it. It doesn't matter. But um, you could have a number of trail options attached to the inciting incident um, and generate a list of these. It could be talk to an NPC or confront the boyfriend or confront the girl's ex. Like, could be a million things. Um, and uh, it sounds, I know I'm oversimplifying uh, because it is actually ends up being a complicated thing where you have all these things that are mixed and matched together, but it can work. I know it can. Uh, then we have what I call the turn. Uh, this is where there's a complication or a betrayal. So if you go and you talk to Meredith, uh, she believes she has a traitor in her ranks who gave Maelstrom the drone, and she offers you a credit chip to pay for it. And you are given the choice to take the credit chip, or you could fight her, or... Uh, what not. And then they also have a second turn, which is that the original person who you did the deal with to get the flathead is gone, and Royce has taken over Maelstrom. So now you're dealing with a new person. So they have two turns in that quest, and both turns make it uh, much more interesting how it plays out. Um, and so you could have a, if you were to procedurally generate turns, uh, it could be that Let's say in the case of the girl saying that her boyfriend's a cyber psycho, it turns out she was lying, uh, or that there's actually two boyfriends and the cyber psycho is going after one of them. Like there could be all sorts of fun complications to add uh, and betrayals. You could generate a list of these, make them make make them all work together. That's the hard part, but it it believe me, it's possible. Um, I've worked on a system like this before. Resolution, the final outcome of your choice choices. So in the game, the way that this quest can go is you can choose to fight Maelstrom and take the drone. You can choose to fight Militech uh, with Maelstrom. Uh, you can peacefully walk away. You still have to avoid Militech, but Militech and Maelstrom will be fighting, so you don't have to deal too much with it. Um, and then there's a fourth option where Royce kills you if he doesn't like uh, how the deal went down. Um, I know killing the player seems like a bad one, but it is actually interesting. And when it makes sense story-wise, yeah, do it. If the player waits too long, I think during the a tense moment where he's got a gun pointed at him, I think that's where Royce just shoots you. Um, and in the resolution, all you have to do is take all the things from the turn and the trail and have each one of those have their own resolutions. Um, and when you do that, they'll be linked to those things, but they're, they're a set that moves around together. So trails and turns have resolutions attached to them, and then you want to have those resolve uh, together. Um, and then the reward. XP, items, faction, content. <laughs> the flathead, get, you get the quest item that lets you continue the main storyline in this case. Um, and if you fought, you get there are certain weapons you can get, like if you kill Royce, I think he has a special iconic one. And then there's just the gear that you get from killing Militech and that drops around and is in the location. Um, all of that is sort of secondary uh, to what is fun about that quest, which is that even though, like I've put it here and it doesn't seem that complicated, but the fact that there are four potential resolutions, three that really matter, um, it's awesome. <laughs> And it, it all comes from one or two little choices along the way. Do you give them the cred ship or not? 
Do you remove the virus that she put on the cred chip or not? Do you even know that it's there? You have to choose to go into your inventory to hack it to remove the virus. Like, and all of those things are tracked and dealt with in that quest. And that's what makes that one quest feel really good. If every quest in the game followed sort of this sort of pattern for Cyberpunk 2077, the whole game would have been immensely improved. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are just like, go to this location, kill the, or take out the cyber psycho. Now, a, a lot of the level design helps there where they built up atmosphere and stuff, but I think that having these procedural quests and randomly generating some elements of it and having random encounters would make the world feel like a less empty place, especially in the late game where it is an empty place and nothing's going on in there. All right. So, yeah, so I just wanted to show that, uh, you know, I, I have recommendations for how they can fix all this stuff. Hey, CD Projekt Red, uh, I know you didn't want me before as a, as a writer, but maybe you need my help for game design. Let me know. So overall, again, this is a great game. It really is. They did, they put a lot of work into this. They did a good job. The problem where it breaks down for me and, and here's the thing, they did The Witcher 3, which is an open world game, and I assume that it feels pretty good, though I haven't gotten deep into it. Um, they, they just, it fell apart at the end. This game needed another year of generating content. Uh, and ideally not generating specific content for this specific location, but generating procedural and random events that could happen anywhere, and specifically... You've got bars on the map. You've got med points on the map to buy stuff. But like, what's the point of a bar? Are you really going to go in there and buy drinks? No. Bars should have random encounters. Drop points should have random encounters. Maybe a mugging. Like, there's all sorts of like cool random encounters that could have happened all over the place, or just followed the player around, or just appeared in certain locations. And you you indicated that there's like these factions, but you didn't support. The, anything with like a faction system it's just general street cred and i think that was a mistake so i'm hoping cd project red will fix these things i'm looking forward to my what will probably be my final playthrough in a year um i'm gonna, i'm not gonna play cyberpunk again until i think all these things are fixed um and right now they're just bug fixing and it's not it's not enough um there are core gameplay issues that need to be addressed. And that's all I really have to say about Cyberpunk 2077 at this point. <clears throat> uh, if anyone has any questions about it, uh, now's a good time. 